Chapter 2, Section 6. Do libertarian capitalists, or so-called anarcho-capitalists, support slavery? Yes. It may come as a surprise to many people, but right libertarianism is one of the few political theories that actually justifies slavery. For example, Robert Nozick asks whether, quote, a free system would allow the individual to sell himself into slavery, and he answers, I believe that it would. See Anarchy, State, and Utopia, page 371 for this citation. While some right libertarians do not agree with Nozick, there is no logical basis in their ideology for such a disagreement. The logic is simple. You cannot really own something unless you can sell it. Self-ownership is one of the cornerstones of laissez-faire capitalist ideology. Therefore, since you own yourself, you can sell yourself. For, Mar uh, for Murray Rothbard's claims of the unenforceability and libertarian theory of voluntary slave contracts, see The Ethics of Liberty, pages 134 to 135. Of course, other libertarian theorists claim the exact opposite, so libertarian theory makes no such claims, but, you know, never mind that. Essentially, his point revolves around the assertion that a person cannot in nature sell himself into slavery and have this sale enforced, for this would mean that his future will over his own body was being uh, uh, surrendered in advance. And that if a, quote, laborer remains totally subservient to his master's will voluntarily, he is not yet a slave since his submission is voluntary. Page 40. However, as noted in section two, Rothbard's emphasis on quitting fails to recognize that actual denial of will and control over one's own body that is explicit in wage labor. It's this failure that pro-slave contract libertarians stress. As we'll see, they consider the slave contract an extended wage contract. Moreover, a modern slave contract would likely take the form of performance bond, See page 136 for this citation, in which the slave agrees to perform X year's labor or pay their master substantial damages. The threat of damages that enforce the contract in such a contract Rothbard does agree is enforceable, along with conditional exchange. See 141 for that citation, which could be another way of creating slave contracts. Nozick's defense of slavery should not really come as a surprise to anyone familiar with classical liberalism, an elite ide elitist ideology. Its main rationale is to defend liberty and power of property owners and justify unfree social relationships such as government and wage labor in terms of consent. Nozick just takes it to, it lo it to its logical conclusion, a conclusion which Rothbard, while balking at the label used, does not actually disagree with. This is because Nozick's argument is not new, but as with so many others, can be found in John Locke's work. The key difference is that Locke refused the term slavery and, f and favored drudgery. As for him, slavery meant a relationship between a lawful conqueror and a captive, where the former has the power of life and death over the latter. Once a compact is agreed between them, quote, an agreement for a limited power on the one side and obedience on the other, slavery ceases. As long as the master could not kill the slave, then it was drudgery. Like Nozick, he acknowledges that men did sell themselves, but it is plain this was only to drudgery, not for slavery, for it is evident the person sold was not under an absolute arbitrary despotical power, for the master could not have power to kill him at any time, whom at a certain time he was obliged to let go free out of his service. See Locke's Second Treatise of Government, section 24, for these citations. In other words, like Rothbard, voluntary slavery is fine, but you just need to call it something else. Not that Locke was bothered by involuntary slavery. <laughs> he was heavily involved in the slave trade. He owned shares in the Royal Africa Company, which carried on the slave trade for England, making a profit when he sold them. He also held a significant share in another slave company, the Bahama Adventurers. In the second treatise, Locke justified slavery in terms of captives taken in a just war. See section 85 for that little piece of work. In other words, a war waged against aggressors. That, of course, had nothing to do with the actual slavery Locke profited from. Slave raids were common, for example. 
nor did his liberal principles stop him suggesting a constitution that would ensure that, quote, every free man of Carolina shall have absolute power and authority over his Negro slaves. The Constitution itself was typically autocratic, hierarchical, designed explicitly, explicitly to, quote, avoid erecting a numerous democracy. See the works of John Locke, vol volume 10, page 196, for these citations. So the notion of contractual slavery has a long history within right-wing liberalism, although most refuse to call it by that name. It is, of course, slightly simply embarrassment that stops Rothbard calling a spade a spade in this instance. He incorrectly assumes that slavery has to be involuntary. In fact, historically, voluntary, voluntary slave contracts have been common. David Ellerman's Property and Contract in Economics has an excellent overview on this if you'd like to read more. Any new form of voluntary slavery would be a civilized form of slavery and could occur when an individual would agree to sell themselves to another as when a starving worker would agree to become a slave in return for food. In addition, the contract would be able to be broken under certain conditions. Perhaps in return for breaking the contract, the former slave would have to pay damages to his or her master for the labor their master would lose, a sizable amount, amount no doubt, and such a payment could result in debt slavery, which is the most common form of civilized slavery. Such damages may be agreed in the contract as a performance bond or conditional exchange. In summary, right libertarians, and by extension so-called anarcho-capitalists, are talking about civilized slavery, or in other words, civil slavery, and not forced slavery. While some have reservations about calling it slavery, they do actually agree with the basic concept that since people own themselves, they can sell themselves as well as selling their labor for a lifetime. We must stress that this is no academic debate either. Voluntary slavery has been a problem in many societies and still exists in many countries today, especially less developed nations where bonded labor, i.e. where debt is used to enslave people, is the most common form. With the rise of sweatshops and child labor in many developed countries, such as the U.S., voluntary slavery, perhaps via debt and bonded labor, have become more common in other parts of the world. An ironic, if not surprising, result of freeing the market and being indifferent to the actual freedom of those within it. And it is interesting to note that even Murray Rothbard is not against the selling of humans. He argued that children are the property of their parents. They can, bar actually murdering them by violence, do whatever they please with them, even selling them on a, quote, flourishing free child market. Again, the ironically named The Ethics of Liberty, page 102. Combined with a wholehearted support for child labor, after all, the child can leave its parents if it objects to working for them, such a free child market could easily become a child slave market, with entrepreneurs making a healthy profit selling infants to other entrepreneurs who can make profits from the toil of their children, and such a process did actually occur in the 19th century Britain. Unsurprisingly, Rothbard ignores the possible nasty aspects of such a market in human flesh, such as children being sold to work in factories, homes, and brothels. And of course, such a market could see women, women specializing in producing children for it. The use of child labor during the Industrial Revolution actually made it economically sensible for families to have more children, and perhaps gluts and scarcities of babies due to changing market conditions. But that's beside the point. Of course, this theoretical justification for slavery at the heart of an ideology calling, it, calling itself libertarianism is hard for many right libertarians to accept. So some of the so-called anarcho-capitalist types argue that such contracts would be very hard to enforce in their system of capitalism. This attempt to get out of the contradiction fails simply because it ignores the nature of the capitalist market. If there is a demand for slave contracts to be enforced, then companies will develop to provide that 
service. And it would be interesting to see how two protection firms, one defending slave contracts and another not, could compromise and reach a peaceful agreement over whether slave contracts were valid. Thus, we could see these so-called anarchist or free society producing companies whose specific purpose was to hunt down escaped slaves. Hmm. Seem to remind me of something, i.e. individuals in slave contracts who had not paid damages to their owners for freedom. Of course, perhaps Rothbard would claim that such slave contracts would be outlawed under his general libertarian law code, but this is a denial of market freedom. If slave contracts are banned, then surely this is paternalism, stopping individuals from contracting out their, laboring, uh, their labor services to whom and however long they desire for. You can't have it both ways in this instance. So, ironically, an ideology proclaiming itself to support liberty ends up justifying and defending slavery. Indeed, for the right libertarian, the slave contract is an exemplification, not the denial of individuals' liberty. How is this possible? How can slavery be supported as an expression of liberty? Simple. Right libertarian support for slavery is a symptom of a deeper authoritarianism, namely their uncritical acceptance of contract theory. The central claim of contract theory is that contract is the means to secure and enhance individual freedom. Slavery is the antithesis to freedom, and so, in theory, contract and slavery must be mutually exclusive. However, as indicated above, some contract theorists, both past and present, have included slave contracts among legitimate contracts. This suggests that contract theory cannot provide the theoretical support needed to secure and enhance individual freedom. So why is this? Well, as Carol Pateman argues, quote, Contract theory is primarily about a way of creating social relations constituted by subordination, not about exchange. Rather than undermining subordination, contract theorists justify modern subjection. Contract doctrine has proclaimed that subjection to a master, a boss, a husband, is freedom. You can see more on this in her seminal work, this, The Sexual Contract, page 40 and pages, oh, page 146. The question central to contract theory, and so right libertarianism, is not are people free as one would expect, but are people free to subordinate themselves in any manner they please? A radically different question, and one only fitting to someone who does not know what liberty means. Anarchists argue that not all contracts are legitimate, and no free individual can make a contract that denies their own freedom. If an individual is able to express themselves by making free agreements, then those free agreements must also be based upon a freedom internally as well. Any agreement that creates domination or hierarchy negates the assumptions underlying the agreement and makes itself null and void. In other words... Voluntary government is still government, and the defining characteristics of an anarchy must be surely no rulers, no masters. This is most easily seen in the extreme case of the slave contract. John Stuart Mill stated that such a contract would be null and void. He argued that any individual may voluntarily choose to enter such a contract, but in doing so, he abdicates his liberty. He forgoes any future use of it beyond that single act. He therefore defeats, in his own case, the very purpose which is the justification of allowing him to dispose of himself. The principle of freedom cannot require that he should be free not to be free. It is not freedom to be allowed to alienate his freedom. He adds that these reasons, the force of which is so conspicuous in this case, are evidently of far wider application. And it is such an application that defenders of capitalism fear. Mill did, in fact, apply these reasons wider and unsurprisingly became a supporter of market syndicalist form of socialism. If we reject slave contracts as illegitimate then, logically, we must also reject all contracts that express qualities similar to slavery, i.e. deny freedom, including wage slavery. 
Given that, as David Ellerman points out, quote, the voluntary slave and the, and the employee cannot, in fact, take their will out of their intentional actions so that they could be employed by the master or employer. We're left with the rather implausible assertion that a person can vacate his or her will for eight or so hours a day for weeks, months, or years on end, but cannot do so for a working lifetime. See Property and Contract in Economics, page 58, for that citation. The implications of supporting voluntary slavery is quite devastating in all forms of right-wing libertarianism. This was proven by Ellerman when he wrote an extremely robust defense of it under the pseudonym J. Fillmore called The Libertarian Case for Slavery, first published in the Philosophical Forum, 1982. This classical rebuttal takes the form of proof by contradiction, or reducto ad absurdum, whereby he takes the arguments of right libertarianism to their logical end and shows how they reach the memorably con a memorable conclusion that the time has come for liberal economic and political thinkers to stop dodging this issue and to critically re-examine their shared prejudices about certain voluntary social institutions. This critical process will inexorably drive liberalism to its only logical conclusion, libertarianism that finally lays true moral foundations for economic and political slavery. Ellerman shows how from a right libertarian perspective, there is a fundamental contradiction in a modern liberal society for the state to prohibit slave contracts. He notes that there, quote, seems to be a basic shared prejudice of liberalism that slavery, slavery is inherently involuntary. So the issue of genuinely voluntary slavery has received little scrutiny. The perfectly valid liberal argument that involuntary slavery is inherently unjust is thus taken to include voluntary slavery, in which case the argument, by definition, does not apply. This has resulted in an abridgment of the freedom of contract in modern liberal society. Thus, it is possible to argue for a civilized form of contractual slavery. So accurate and logical was Ellerman's article that many of its readers were convinced it was written by a right libertarian, including, we have to say, many of the people involved in the creation of this document originally. One such writer was Carol Pateman, who correctly noted that, quote, there is a nice historical irony here. In the American South, slaves were emancipated and turned into wage laborers. And now American contractarians argue that all workers should have the opportunity to turn themselves into civil slaves. The aim of Ellerman's article was to show the problems that employment, wage labor, presents for the concept of self-government and how contract need not result in social relationships based on freedom. As Fillmore put it, any thorough and decisive critique of voluntary slavery or constitutional non-democratic government would carry over to the employment contract, which is the voluntary contractual basis for the free market free enterprise system. Such a critique would thus be reducto ad absurdum. As contractual slavery is an extension of the employer-employee contract, he shows that the difference between wage labor and slavery is the time scale rather than the principal or social relationships involved. This explains, firstly, the early workers' movement called capitalism wage slavery, as anarchists still do, and secondly, why capitalists like Rothbard support the concept but balk at the name. It exposes the unfree nature of the system they support, while it's possible to present wage labor as freedom due to its consensual nature. It becomes much harder to do so when talking about slavery or dictatorship. Then the contradictions are exposed for all to see and be horrified by. All this does... Uh, all this does not mean that we must just oh, we must reject free agreement. Far from it. Free agreement is essential for a society based upon individual dignity and liberty. There are various forms of free agreement, and anarchists support those based upon cooperation and self-management, i.e. individuals working together as equals. Anarchists desire to create relationships which reflect and so express the liberty that is the basis of free agreement. 
capitalism creates relationships that deny liberty. The opposition between uh, the opposition between autonomy and subjection can only be maintained by modifying or rejecting contract theory, something that capitalism cannot do. And so the right wing libertarian rejects autonomy in favor of subjection, and so rejects socialism in favor of capitalism. The real contrast between anarchism and right libertarianism is best expressed in their respective opinions on slavery. Anarchism is based upon the individual whose individuality depends upon the maintenance of free relationships with other individuals. If individuals deny their capacities for self-government from themselves through a contract, the individuals bring about a qualitative change in their relationship to others. Freedom is turned into mastery and subordination. For the anarchist, slavery is thus the paradigm of what freedom is not, instead of an exemplification of what is as right libertarian state. As Proudhon argued, if I were asked to answer the following question, what is slavery? And I should answer in one word, it is murder. My meaning would be understood at once. No extended argument would be required to show that the power to take from a man his thought, his will, his personality is a power of life and death and that to enslave a man is to kill him. Page 37. What is property? In contrast, the right libertarian effectively argues that I support slavery because I believe in liberty. It is a sad reflection of the ethical and intellectual bankruptcy of our society that such an argument is actually taken seriously by anyone, let alone any appreciable amount of people. The concept of slavery as freedom is far too Orwellian to even warrant a critique. We'll, we will leave it up to right libertarians to corrupt our language and ethical standards with an attempt to prove it, I suppose. From the basic insight that slavery is the opposition of freedom, the anarchist rejection of authoritarian social relations quickly follows the right-wing libertarians' fear. Libertarian, uh, liberty is inviolable. It can neither, I can neither sell nor alienate my liberty. Every contract, every condition of a contract, which has in the view of alienation or suspension of liberty is null. The slave, when he plants his foot upon the soil of liberty at that moment, becomes a free man. Liberty is the original condition of man. To renounce liberty is to renounce the nature of man. After that, how could we perform the acts of man? Proudhon, page 67. The employment contract, i.e. wage slavery, abrogates liberty. It is based upon inequality of power, and exploitation is a consequence of the fact that the sale of labor power entails the worker's subordination. Hence, Proudhon and Mill's effort of self uh, support of self-management and opposition to capitalism any relationship that resembles slavery is illegitimate and no contract that creates a relationship of subordination is valid thus in a truly anarchistic society slave contracts would be unenforceable people in a truly free i.e. non-capitalist society would never tolerate such a horrible institution or consider it a valid agreement if someone was silly enough to sign such a contract, they would simply have to say they now rejected it in order to be free. Such contracts are made to be broken, and without the force of law and system and private defense firms to back it up, such contracts would stay broken. The right libertarian and the so-called anarcho-capitalists Support for slave contracts and wage slavery indicates that their ideology 